From this point forward, a lot of the lab and lecture topics will overlap, and where they overlap, I will plan to cover them in one lecture. So this lecture not only is for the Chapter 17 on the Special Senses, but will also be part of the lab for the Eye Anatomy and Vision Physiology. Let's start by covering the accessory structures of the eyes. And these are the things that are going to protect the eye and support it. So the first thing that comes to mind, obviously, are the eyelids that cover the eyes. And then we will have the superficial epithelium of the eye, and we will see that the eyeball itself is covered with an epithelium that then folds back and is continuous with that of the eyelids. The eyelids, the anatomical term for them, is the palpebrae. Palpebra is singular, and the palpebrae are what's going to close over your eyes. You have a superior and inferior one. And then, of course, we are going to have a lacrimal apparatus. And lacrima, well, means tears. So lacrimal has to do with tears. So the lacrimal apparatus is going to produce tears, and it's going to be located in the orbit of the eye in an indention in the frontal bone. And so it's going to be on the superior lateral aspect of the eye, and it's going to produce tears that will constantly keep the eye lubricated. So when we look at the eyelids, these are the palpebrae, they're continuation of skin, and they will be blinking continuously so that we can not only lubricate the eye, but we can also keep dust and debris out. The palpebral fissure is simply the space between the eyelids. So if you close your eyelids, then the palpebral fissure disappears. When you open your eyes wide, then the palpebral fissure is quite wide. So the palpebral fissure is simply the space between the eyelids. Now we can look at the eye very closely and we can see the folds of skin on either side of it. So we have a medial canthus where the two eyelids come together, and we have a lateral canthus, also where the two eyelids come together on the lateral aspect. The eyelashes are these hairs right here, and they keep insects, dust, and so forth from getting to the surface of the eye most of the time. And then we are going to have some glands called tarsal glands, and these are going to secrete this lipid substance that's going to mix with the secretions of the tears and create this really slick fluid, and that helps keep the eyelids from sticking together. We have tarsal glands, are also called meibomian glands, and they're important for basically keeping your eyelids from sticking together and helping to keep your eyes moist. All right, now if we look at the medial part of the eye again, we will see that within that lateral, or sorry, medial fold, that medial canthus, we will have what's called the lacrimal caruncle. That's just simply this pink stuff right here. So the pink stuff, that soft tissue in the medial part of your eye, that is going to be the lacrimal caruncle. And it's going to create some secretions that you probably felt as crusty stuff in your eyes, especially if you wake up after a long sleep or sometimes if you've been out in the pollen or other dust and other things, and you stick your fingers in your eyes and you feel this gritty stuff there. That is some secretions from the lacrimal caruncle. Now, the conjunctiva is the epithelium that's going to cover the inner surface of the eyelids and the outer surface of the eyeball. And so we have the palpebral conjunctiva. That is going to be the epithelium on the inside of the eyelid. And then that's going to fold back and become continuous with is what is called the ocular or sometimes the bulbar conjunctiva, which covers the surface of the eye. And where it arches back and makes this kind of a shape, we have a vault-like structure called the fornix. Now, fornix is a term we've seen before. So we will see it a lot in anatomy anytime we have something that is a vault-like structure. So here we can see the eye here. We can see the medial part of the eye, the medial canthus here. We have the lacrimal caruncle here. We have the lateral canthus over here. Our two palpebrae, you can see this one's up here. Uh, you can see the eyelashes. You can also see this person's wearing mascara, something that I had not really noticed before until I took a look at this again for the class. But yes, you can definitely see the person's got not only mascara, but eyeshadow on too. We can see the iris of the eye, which is the colored part. And that is going to be inside the eye. The part, the clear part that covers the iris is called the cornea. And the cornea is continuous with the sclera, which is the external part of the eye. So the external white part of the eye then will give way to this
clear transparent part of the eye called the cornea and be aware that the cornea is on the outside of the eye. It is not deep. It is on the outside. It is continuous with the sclera and together they will make up what is called the outer fibrous tunic or fibrous layer of the eye. Now because the cornea is transparent you can see through and you can see this muscle here. It's a bunch of muscles. They are smooth muscles called the iris and that is going to regulate the size of the pupil and that's what allows light to get inside the eye. So the pupil will change diameter depending on the amount of light coming in. So in very low light circumstances you would have a very wide dilated pupil let more light in and in very bright light circumstances situations that pupil will constrict and that's to keep excess light out. And that's also to prevent damage from the very sensitive sheet on the back of the eye of photoreceptors that we will talk about later. And that's what is responsible for turning light into neural impulses. And it is called the retina and is deep within the eye. And we'll look at it in just a little bit. For now, let's continue our discussion of the external parts of the eye. We would have our lacrimal gl gland is not seen here, but it would be up here and it would be nestled into what we call the lacrimal fossa of the frontal bone. And we'll have several ducts that feed into the fornix where the conjunctiva folds back from the inside of the eyelid to the surface of the eyeball. Where we have the junction between the cornea and the sclera, that's sort of this gray area here, that is called the corneal limbus. And if you recall from previous anatomical terms that we've learned, limbus means border. Like the limbic system is the border between the diencephalon and the cerebrum and is on the border there. So it's in the cerebrum, but it's on the border between the diencephalon and the cerebrum. Likewise, the corneal limbus is really the border between the sclera, the white part, and the, uh, the cornea, the transparent part of the eye the outer transparent part of the eye. All right, so let's look at the lacrimal apparatus. This is what is going to make the tears. We're going to have several ducts that, that produce the tears or bring the tears, I should say, to the eye. So the lacrimal glands on either side produce the tears, and there'll be several lacrimal ducts that dump into that fornix, the fold where the palpebral conjunctiva turns into the ocular conjunctiva, and then we are going to have the production of tears through this lacrimal apparatus, this lacrimal gland. And this tears, these tears are a watery fluid, and they will contain a special enzyme called lysozyme. And that helps keep bacteria off and, and basically will lyse or break bacteria. So when we look at tears, they will collect in an area of the lacrimal caruncle called the lacrimal lake and it's so called because this is where the tears will collect and they collect medially so tears wash this way across the eyes from superior lateral to inferior medial and so then once they get into the lacrimal lake they will pass through two points called the lacrimal puncta and puncta means point in this case there are two little holes and those holes will lead into little canals and as we have seen before the term for a little canal is a canaliculus so we will have two lacrimal canaliculi on either side and we will have a superior and inferior lacrimal canaliculus and these are little canals through which the tears travel from the eye to an area called the lacrimal sac and the lacrimal sac is a little sac that collects the tears and then will then drain them into the the nasal area via something called the nasolacrimal duct so if we look at it here we can see our lacrimal gland, we can see the lacrimal ducts, and the tears would wash this way across the eye, co collect in the lacrimal lake of the lacrimal caruncle. Here we see a lacrimal punctum, punctum is singular of puncta, which is just a point, and we see that there are two of them, a superior and inferior one, and they lead into the superior and inferior lacrimal canaliculi, respectively which then lead into the lacrimal sac, which then drains into the nasolacrimal duct. Now, we also have six extrinsic muscles of the eye. And the extrinsic muscles of the eye move the eye, or what's responsible for us to be able to look around. And we have four called rectus. And as you recall, rectus means straight. So these are straight muscles. And we have a superior rectus muscle, an inferior rectus, 
a medial rectus, which can't see here, it's blocked, but it's, it's in there, and we have a lateral rectus muscle as well. We also have two oblique muscles. We have a superior oblique muscle, which will pull through this little piece of connective tissue that acts as a pulley called the trochlea. So remember our trochlear nerve. The trochlear nerve is going to control the superior oblique muscle, and the trochlear nerve gets its name from the fact that it's going to innervate the muscle that is going to pull through this little pulley called the trochlea. Here we have the inferior oblique muscle. Now the eye itself is in the orbit and is surrounded by this fat, this orbital fat, and that helps protect the eye and cushion it and keep it from bouncing around in there. Now let's talk about the three layers of the eye. We've already seen one of them, and that is consisting of the sclera and the cornea, and that is the outer fibrous layer, sometimes called the fibrous tunic. Sometimes these layers are called tunics. So we have our outer fibrous tunic, then we're going to have an, a layer in between called the vascular layer, sometimes called the uvea. And this is going to consist of several structures, some of which we've already seen. So it's going to consist of the iris. It's going to consist of a muscle that will control, or a whole area, which includes the muscle, that will control the focus of the eye, called the ciliary body. And it will also consist of a portion called the choroid. The choroid is going to be a highly vascularized layer. So these three things, we'll look at them in a little bit, they will comprise the intermediate layer, the vascular layer. Then we're going to have the deep inner layer, which is also called the neural layer or the neural tunic, and it will include the retina, which has both a pigmented layer and a neural layer. So we will look at these things in more detail as we progress through the chapter. Let's look at the eyeball itself. So the eyeball is hollow, as we know, and we have two large cavities. So everything in front of the ciliary body and the, the lens, and the lens is a clear part of the eye that's in the eye. It's in the eyeball, not on the external surface. And it is what will change shape to allow us to focus. So we have the lens, which is going to be one of our dividing lines between the anterior cavity, which is smaller, and it extends up to the cornea. And then we're going to have the posterior cavity, which is everything behind the lens and the ciliary body. So everything really behind the lens is going to be the posterior cavity. And that lens will be held in place by the bulge of the ciliary cavity or ciliary, ciliary body, which we'll look at in just a bit. Now these are fluid filled cavities. And we will see that we have uh, something called aqueous humor which will fill the entire anterior cavity and also sort of percolate back into the posterior cavity. And then we will have the posterior cavity and it keeps its shape because it has this big gelatinous stuff in the back of it, or just big gelatinous stuff that occupies the entire posterior cavity called vitreous, the vitreous body. And so it's going to be a clear gelatinous mass. And then we're going to have fluid called aqueous humor that will be made in the smaller anterior cavity and circulated through both the anterior cavity and the posterior cavity. We'll look at that in more detail in just a bit. So here is the eyeball. And now we can see several things. We can see our eyelid. Here is our conjunctiva here. This is our palpebral conjunctiva. Where it folds back is called the fornix. And remember, fornix means vault. And then we have our ocular conjunctiva. Sometimes this is also called the bulbar conjunctiva because the eyeball is a bulbous structure. Then we are going to have our outer fibrous tunic or layer, which is going to consist of the sclera here, and that is the white of the eye. And then the sclera is continuous with the cornea, which is the clear outer portion of the eye. Behind the cornea, we're going to see the pupil, sorry, the iris and the pupil. The pupil is the hole in the iris. And the iris is going to be the set of smooth muscles that's going to control the diameter of the pupil. The lens is another clear structure in the eye, and it's going to help us change our focus from near to far. And it's going to do this by changing shape. And we'll look at the physiology of that in a little bit. The lens is held in place by this part of the ciliary body. Now the ciliary body extends back to here. And this is the border of the ciliary body. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But right now, suffice it to say, the lens 
is the interior part of the clear in part of the eye on the interior, and it is held in place by the ciliary body, and we have these little suspensory ligaments that are holding it there. And we have a muscle in here that will contract and relax, and when it does so, it will change the shape of the lens by lessening or increasing the tension on these little suspensory ligaments. And this area is called the ciliary, ciliary zonule, and we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail. Now, let's look at all the parts of the uvea, or the vascular layer. That's going to include the pupil, or sorry, the iris. Once again, the iris is part of that, and the pupil is just the hole in, in, that's created by the iris. Oops. So the pupil is the hole that is created by the iris, and the iris itself is the structure of smooth muscle that's going to change the diameter of the pupil. That is part of the uvea, and that's continuous with the ciliary body. And this part here is the ciliary body, which is going to contain the muscles for focusing the eye. Then the ciliary body will extend to here, and we have this border here between the ciliary body and the another part of the eye, the retina. And this border, where it makes this serrated edge, is called the aura serrata. So the aura serrata here is going to be the border between the ciliary body, which is pigmented. And we'll see in real life, it's a very, very, very dark brown, almost black color. And then we will have the ciliary body, which will be continuous with what is called the choroid. And that would be this middle layer. And this, all of this is the choroid. And the choroid is going to be sandwiched between the sclera of the fibrous layer and the retina of the neural layer or the neural tunic. And the innermost tunic will be called the neural tunic. And that is this retina. And the retina is the neural part of the eye. And the retina has two layers itself. It has a pigmented layer. And the pigmented layer extends over the ciliary body. And that's what makes it dark. But the neural part of the retina is what stops at the aura serrata. So it is basically going to cover the posterior two-thirds of the eye. So basically this covers the lumen of the eye. And this is what is going to transduce the light coming into the eye into a neural signal. Now leaving the eye, we have something called the optic nerve. And this is our cranial nerve too. This is going to carry signals from the eyeball, from the retina, because the retina's job is to turn light into neural impulses. So those neural impulses will then be carried via the optic nerve to the occipital cortex. And we'll talk more about that pathway in a little bit more detail later on. Now there's one part of the eye that I would like to point out to you, just lateral to the optic nerve, and that is called the fovea. And the fovea, is the part of the retina where we have our best vision. So our highest acuity vision is located in this area here called the fovea. The fovea in turn is located in an area called the macula lutea, or simply macula. And macula means spot, and lutea means yellow. And when you look at people's eyeballs with the uh, scope, sometimes you can see a sort of a yellowish spot. So macula lutea means yellow spot. And some people just call it the macula for short. And it's just a spot on the iris, or sorry, on the retina, not on the iris. So the fovea is right in the middle of that macula. All right, now let's look at the different cavities. We've got our anterior cavity, which extends from the cornea to the lens. And we have the posterior cavity, which is everything behind the lens. And the posterior cavity is going to contain our vitreous humor, which is this gelatinous sort of globular body. If you were to take it out of the eyeball, it has about the consistency of jello. And we'll actually see it in lab. It's a gelatinous body, and it helps really maintain the shape of the eye. Because remember, the eye is hollow, and you've got these six muscles pulling on it all the time. And you can imagine if you pulled on a hollow object, it might warp it or distort it. So one of the jobs of the vitreous humor, or vitreous body, sometimes also called the vitreous humor, is to prevent distortion of the eyeball. We will also see that in the anterior cavity, we can subdivide it further 
into what we call an anterior chamber, and that's just the anterior part of the anterior of the anterior cavity, and a posterior chamber, which is everything behind the iris to the lens. So this is called the posterior chamber. And so the anterior and posterior chamber are both part of the anterior cavity. Now we can see our three layers once again. We can see our outer fibrous layer that consists of the sclera and the clear cornea. We can see the uvea or the vascular layer which consists of the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid which would be this beige part back here. And then we're going to have our retina, our neural layer, and that's going to be this part right here, sort of the salmon color or pink part in here. Here is our fovea. Sometimes it's called the fovea centralis. And notice that it's just going to be lateral to the optic nerve. And the optic nerve is going to carry the neural impulses from the eye to the brain. Now, if we look at it in the more detailed view, once again, we can see our sclera, the white of the eye here, continuous with our transparent cornea. And then we're going to have the anterior chamber is in here. So everything from the lens up to the cornea. And we're going to have our anterior, well, I should say anterior cavity. I'll backtrack on that. This whole thing is the anterior cavity from the lens to the cornea. The anterior chamber of the anterior cavity is going to be this part from the iris to the cornea. The posterior chamber of the anterior cavity is everything between the lens and the iris. So this is the posterior chamber. Now, if we look behind the lens and the bulging part of the ciliary body here, everything back here is the posterior chamber. And it is not further subdivided. So it's just going to have a big blob of vitreous humor or a vitreous body in here that's going to help the eyeball keep its shape. Another thing I should mention is we also have in the eye a fluid called the aqueous humor. And the aqueous humor is produced by the ciliary processes of the ciliary body here. And what we will see is that it is just a fluid. And it is being produced continuously. And it will flow into the anterior cavity. Some of it will percolate into the posterior cavity as well and surround the vitreous humor. And one of the things that it does, it helps keep the retina in place, helps keep the retina against the back of the eyeball, but it also gives shape to the anterior part of the eye here. So it's going to help the cornea not flatten out and these kinds of things. So the aqueous humor is constantly being made and it's being circulated through the eyeball and it's also constantly being resorbed. So about as much as being resorbed as is being made. And we have around the cornea, the limbus, we have uh, something called the uh, sclerovenous sinus. And this is what's going to drain the aqueous humor from the eyeball at the same rate that the ciliary body is making the stuff. And it leads into an area called the canal of Schlem. So that's basically another name for the sclerovena sinus. We'll look at it in a little bit later detail, or a little bit more detail later on. But suffice it to say that for people who don't drain the stuff fast enough, or they make too much of it, the aqueous humor, they can get a condition called glaucoma. And glaucoma means too much pressure in the eye. So this is an important disease that one must be aware of because it can cause blindness. Because as too much aqueous humor, accumulates in the eye, it will put pressure on the back of the eye. And it will especially put pressure on this optic nerve. And the optic nerve is going to be the weakest part of the eye because this is where we have a hole in the sclera. And the sclera is our fibrous connective tissue part of the eye. It has some elastic fibers in it too, but it is mostly dense connective tissue. And so it's going to be very resistant to pressure Whereas the optic nerve here and where the optic nerve exits the eyeball is called the optic disc. Pressure on the optic disc can start to damage the optic nerve. And um, this can lead to blindness if it's not corrected. So this is important and it's an important clinical thing that you will probably be exposed to in your careers. And not only that, but it's fairly prevalent in people who have diabetes. So diabetes can predispose one to glaucoma. And glaucoma right now is the leading cause of blindness in the United States. 
All right, so let's go through the layers once again. The sclera is the white of the eye, and the cornea is the clear part of the eye. They're both part of the fibrous layer, and the corneal limbus is the border between the cornea and the sclera. All right, the, the uvea is the vascular layer, so we're going to have a lot of blood vessels in this thing, a lot of lymphatics that are going to supply the tissues of the eye. Because the iris is part of the uvea, it's going to regulate, regulate the amount of light entering the eye by changing the pupillar diameter. We're also going to see, remember, our ciliary body, as we talked about, is going to secrete the aqueous humor that circulates within the chambers of the eye. Um, well, actually, that's kind of incorrect. This, yeah, this is in the vascular layer, sorry. It's going to secrete that stuff that's in the eye, and then we're going to have the canal of Schlem, which really is going to run through the, the border of the, the cornea, or right around the corneal limbus there. And then we're going to have our ciliary body, which is going to change the shape of the lens, and that's how we focus. So this is the vascular layer. Once again, we've got the choroid layer, which has lots and lots of blood vessels and lymphatics in it. It's going to regulate the amount of light entering the eye because the iris is part of it, which regulates the diameter of the pupils. We're going to secrete our aqueous humor through the ciliary body, and the ciliary body is also going to be responsible for changing the shape of the lens, either flat, allowing it to flatten out or letting it become more spherical. All right, now the iris is part of the vascular layer, and it has some pupillary muscles that are going to change the diameter of the pupil. So let's have a look. Here we have some radial muscles that are going to dilate it, and then we have some other muscles that act like a sphincter that cause constriction. So we have two sets of muscles, the pupillary dilator muscles, which are radially arranged, and the pupillary constrictor muscles, which are basically a sphincter. So just like the orbicularis oculi, they put things shut. So these things are under the control of the autonomic nervous system. And as you probably recall from previous lectures, that the dilation of the eye occurs under sympathetic stimulation because we want to, to allow light in and be aware of what's going on around us and shift our focus out here. Whereas during parasympathetic stimulation in the rest and digest phase, we're going to constrict the pupil and that typically will help us, you know, decrease the amount of light coming into the into the eyeball and that's generally when we have our focus on more close or intimate things. Now, these don't focus the eyes at all, but they do control the amount of light coming into the eye. We will also see that we have pupillary reflexes that are going to cause the, these muscles either to constrict or to dilate. And we saw our pupillary reflexes. We saw our consensual reflex where we shine the light in one pupil and both pupils constricted. They went from large to small. So that's the consensual pupillary reflex that is to protect your eye from too much light. So as soon as a bright light shines in one eye, both pupils will constrict. So it is both a contralateral and consensual reflex. It's also an ipsilateral reflex because it happens on the same side the stimulus occurs as well as the opposite side the stimulus occurred. And whenever we have something occurring on both sides, we call that consensual. We also had our ciliospinal reflex, and that's if you rub on the back of the neck here or pinch really hard, the person's eye on that side will dilate. And that is simply an ipsilateral response. It happens only on one side. And so that's an example from last week's lab that where we saw some of these reflexes of these muscles here. All right, now let's look at some of the other parts of the vascular layer. We have the ciliary body, and this is going to extend to that border that we call the ora serrata. And ora serrata literally means serrated mouth. And so it's going to be, it's going to contain the ciliary process, which is the thing that bulges out and holds the, the lens in place, the ciliary zonal, which the suspensory ligaments are attached, are there and then we're going to have the ciliary muscle and this is what attaches literally it's part of the ciliary process and this is where our 
suspensory ligaments to the lens are going to be attached. So the changing of the muscle tone in this ciliary body is going to change the tension on these ciliary ligaments, these suspensory ligaments, sorry, and that is going to change the shape of our lens from spherical to flat and so forth. The choroid is the vascular layer, and once again, that's going to be between, between the retinal tunic, the neural tunic on the inside of the eye, and the sclera on the outside of the eye, and this is going to bring a lot of oxygen nutrients to the retina. So the inner, inter, bleh, sorry, inner layer of the eye is the neural tunic, and it contains the retina. And the retina has a pigmented part which is very much like the back of the camera. If you ever look at the back of a camera, it's basically dark, it's black, and that's to keep light from bouncing around in there and creating all these extra reflections. Then we have the inner part called the neural part, and that is the retina. That is the part that is going to transduce the signal for, of light into neural impulses. So whenever we have transduction, we're basically converting a stimulus into a bunch of neural impulses. So our, in this case, the stimulus is light, and we are going to transduce that signal into neural impulses. Now we have in, these, in this retina things called photoreceptors, and these are receptors that are sensitive to light. And we have two types of photoreceptors. We have rods, which are the most abundant, and they're all around the periphery of the retina. And these are going to distinguish only black and white, so they don't have any color vision at all, but they are highly sensitive to light, so they will become operative in very, very low light conditions. This is what you use to see at night. Now, rods are not as high acuity as the second type that we have called cones, and cones see color, and we can think of cones for color, and that's an easy way to remember them, but cones have much higher visual acuity, and they are located in that fovea, that fovea centralis and the macula around it. So we have most of our cones located in the very direct back of our eye where light's going to strike most directly, and then the cones surround, or sorry, the rods surrounding that. So the rods are very good for low light. They're very good at picking up motion, peripheral motion. They're good at, at detecting at shapes and, and lines and edges, but they're not good at distinguishing. So they don't have a very high visual acuity. It's very grainy out there. So you can say that the center of your eye is like your high resolution camera. Let's say you got 60 megapixel resolution. I have no idea what it is in, in life, but very high resolution in the center of the eye where the cones are and a lot lower resolution with the rods of the eye. But they're very good in very low light circumstances and they're also good at detecting movement and edges. All right, so let's have a look at the retina. The retina, here's the pigmented part, and we call this the pigmented epithelium. Now we can see the rods and cones. They're the innermost layer of the neural part. Okay, here's the eye itself. Here's the light coming in. So we have our rods and cones. These are our photoreceptors. These are the things that are going to react to light, and we'll look at how they do that in a bit. And notice that these things get their name from their shapes. So cones are cone-shaped. Rods are rod-shaped. Now, on this end of the retina, we have what are called retinal ganglion cells. And retinal ganglion cells are going to take the signals from the rods and cones, so from the photoreceptors in general. So all the photoreceptors will be connected to something called a bipolar cell because it has two ends and the bipolar cells will relay the signal from the photoreceptors to these retinal ganglion cells. And the retinal ganglion cells notice their axons. Their axons are going to turn and go toward that optic nerve. In fact, their axons will gather up, bundle up here, and become the optic nerve. So it is the axons of the retinal ganglion cells that will become the optic nerve that will then relay the signal from the photoreceptors to the brain. So we've got this three layers of the retina, of the neural layer. We've got our photoreceptors in the back. We've got our bipolar cells in the middle. We've got our retinal ganglion cells in the front. And it's their axons that are going to form the optic nerve. And then we have these cells here. We've got horizontal cells that are going to make lateral connections across the 
junctions between the photoreceptors and the bipolar cells, and this is going to modulate some of the activity of these things and modulate some of the sensitivities here. And over here we have what are called amacrine cells, and these are very similar, except they're going to be modulating the junctions between the bipolar cells and the retinal ganglion cells. So sometimes we just shorten this to ganglion cells, but to be more clear, these are retinal ganglia, ganglion cells because they are going to be taking the information from our photoreceptors and relaying it to the brain. Now, we're going to have some modulation of activity, and this can change the sensitivity of the retina and these photoreceptors. So again, we've got these horizontal and amacrine cells, which are going to change the sensitivity of the synapses here and so forth. And one thing else I would like to point out to you, and we can go back to some of our previous lectures about receptive fields. And as you recall, the smaller the receptive field, the more sensitive that thing is, or I should say, the, the greater the discrimination you have of where something's located. So notice that our cones have typically a one-to-one -one connection with our bipolar cells. So here's a cone, here's a cone. It has a one-to-one -one connection with the bipolar cells. So this is a very small receptive field. And we'll talk about receptive fields in the eye a little bit later on. But this is where we're going to have our highest acuity vision. So let's say our highest acuity vision, just for theoretical argument, is 60 megapixels. And let's say our lowest acuity vision is 10 megapixels. So, you know, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but our cones would be providing the 60 megapixels, whereas the rods, especially the ones out on the periphery, would be providing the 10 megapixel, which would be a much grainier image. And when you look at how they're connected to the bipolar cells, you can see why. We've got convergence of three or four rods here onto one bipolar cell. And so we're going to have much larger receptive fields here. So our rods are going to have much larger receptive fields than our cones. Here's an actual picture. And one of the things that you're asked to do in lab is to be able to distinguish the layers. So one of the things you will see immediately is you will see the rods and cones are all in this layer. These are the cell bodies of the rods and cones. These are going to be those top portions, the segmented portions that we see up here. So we see we've got all these segments, and these are like little disks of membrane. So we've got cones here and rods here, and they're, if you notice, they're segmented, and they have these little disks. So picking back up from before the phone rang, we've got the rods and cones, the photoreceptors here, these are the nuclei within the cell bodies of the rods and cones. Then the next layer, we're going to see the nuclei of the bipolar cells. So this is the bipolar cell layer. And then we're going to see the, the nuclei of the retinal ganglion cells here. So this is all retina. These are going to be the axons of the retinal ganglion cells. But the cell bodies, the nuclei within the cell bodies, or the nuclei themselves, are stained very darkly, and they're very obvious. You'll notice how densely packed the nuclei of are the rods and cones, of the photoreceptors. And then when we get to the bipolar cell layer, we're going to have fewer nuclei, and even fewer nuclei here in the retinal ganglion cells. One thing to note, the density of these cell bodies, these nuclei of the bipolar and retinal ganglion cells, will depend on what part of the retina you're in. If you're in the fovea centralis, you'll have quite a few retinal ganglion cells because just about every cone will make a one-to-one -one connection with a retinal ganglion cell. As you get out in the more peripheral area of the eye, the more lateral parts of the eye, and more medial, so basically anything that surrounds the fovea centralis, we're going to find fewer and fewer retinal ganglion cell bodies because we're going to have larger receptive fields, so we're going to have more convergence by photoreceptors onto bipolar and retinal ganglion cells. Now, notice behind the retina, we have the part of the retina called the pigmented epithelium. So this is the pigmented epithelium, and then behind that, we have the choroid, which is also usually quite dark. Um, a lot of times when we see it in vivo, it's quite dark. This typically, in a lot of our slides, will also appear dark, and this one not as much. 
but typically that's what we would see. So if you see a slide of the retina in lab, you will be able to, you should be able to recognize where the photoreceptors are versus the bipolar cells versus the retinal ganglion cells. Now you can't really see the amacrine and horizontal cells here. So um, you wouldn't, would not be expected to identify those. You should immediately be able to identify the pigmented part in the choroid. All right, so let's look now at the back part of the eye and let's have a look at how this works. So here we have our pigmented part of the retina. We've got our choroid behind it. Here we have our photoreceptors. Here are our bipolar cells. Here are our horizontal cells. Here are our amacrine cells right here. And these are our ganglion cells. So the green are ganglion, these guys reaching across, the little orange ones, are our amacrine cells. Our red ones are the bipolar cells. These sort of orangey-brown ones are horizontal cells. And the purple ones are the photoreceptors. Now notice how the axons of the ganglion cells all converge at the optic disc and make the optic nerve. So this is the optic disc. And the optic disc is that part of the eyeball where these retinal ganglion cell axons converge, and then they turn to form the optic nerve, so cranial nerve 2. Right through the center of this thing, we have the central retinal artery and vein, and that's going to provide blood, blood flow to the retina. Behind the, behind the pigmented epithelium of the retina, you have the choroid, which is this part here. And behind that, you have the sclera. So a lot of times, you'll be able to see the sclera in a lot of the slides, depending on how much of it they include. All right, here we have the optic disc. And here you can see the central artery and vein emerging. And if you look over here, here you see the fovea centralis in the middle of the macula. All right, now we can look at the bipolar cells. Once again, these are the ones that are going to relay the signal from the photoreceptors to the ganglion cells. Then we've got the horizontal cells. We've seen those already. These are going to be making the connections with the photoreceptors and the bipolar cells, and they're going to be modulating the activity therein. And then the amacrine cells are going to be the ones on the other side that are going to be modulating the activity of the bipolar cells with the ganglion cells. And the, remember, the way I remember which is where, amacrine has as many syllables as ganglion. So amacrine with ganglion. So the amacrine cells are going to be on the same side as the ganglion cells. All right. So these are going to, as we've said, modulate the activity between the photoreceptors and the ganglion cells, or in the case of the amacrine cells, the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells. So this is going to alter the sensitivity of the retina. And the optic disc we've seen is where all those axons from the retinal ganglion cells converge. And because there are no photoreceptors there, let's have a look at it again. Notice there are no photoreceptors in here. The photoreceptors stop on either side of the optic nerve. That means this area doesn't see. This is what's called a blind spot. So you cannot see anything in this area because this is where the optic nerve exits the eye. And that juncture where all those retinal ganglion cell axons converge is called the optic disc. So the optic disc is the blind spot. It doesn't see anything. You can't, no image will appear there. All right, so now let's look at the blind spot test. Now, if you're sitting at your computer about as far as I am, and you close your left eye and you look at the cross with your right eye, the circle will disappear. And that just shows that there's an area where your eye doesn't see. Likewise, if I stand over here, close my right eye, and look at the circle with the left eye, the X will disappear, the cross will disappear. And this is a fairly typical demonstration of the blind spot. You can try this yourself. There's a picture of this in your book. We will talk about this in lab as well. And this would be something that you would expect to know. So this is blind spot mapping. This pretty much tells you where your blind spot is, where that optic disc is. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the chambers of the eye. We know that the ciliary body and the lens divides the eye into the posterior cavity behind it. And that's also sometimes called the vitreous chamber because it contains the vitreous body, which is that gelatinous mass in the eye. 
Now the smaller anterior cavity, which is in front of the ciliary body in the lens, is then subdivided into the anterior chamber from the, the iris to the cornea and the posterior chamber from the basically the iris to the ciliary body in the lens. All right, so we know that the aqueous humor is made within that anterior chamber, and it circulates not only within the anterior chamber, but around the vitreous body in the posterior chamber as well. And it will be drained via the scleral venous sinus, also called the canal of Schlem. That's too good of a word not to have to say, canal of Schlem. And so this is what gives us our intraocular pressure. That's the fluid pressure within the eyeball. And that's what helps keep the eye inflated, if you will. So it helps the eye keep its shape. So we can measure this with a tonometer. And it should be between, what, 10 and 21 millimeters of mercury, somewhere around in there. When it gets above 21 millimeters of mercury, that is an indication of glaucoma. And glaucoma, now that we know the physiology and the anatomy of the eye a little bit, if we go back here and we look at the back of the eye, we know that this optic disc is going to be where the optic nerve leaves the eye. And notice that we have no scleral wall here. So this is the weak point. So when you have too much ocular pressure, this gets pushed in like this. So instead of being sort of continuous with the curvature of the eye in the back, it actually gets smushed in. We call this a cupped optic nerve. Some people have what's called a physiologic cupped optic nerve. That means they're born with it. But a lot of times a cupped optic nerve is basically when the pressure is so great in the eye that it squishes the optic nerve and makes it concave. And this eventually can cause damage to those, those axons of the retinal ganglion cells, which are part of the optic nerve, and then it can cause vision loss. And this is very important to monitor in people with diabetes, especially because they're predisposed to it, to glaucoma. So let's have a look at the chambers of the eye. So here's the anterior chamber, everything from the ciliary body and lens up to the cornea. And everything behind the ciliary body and the lens is the posterior cavity, sometimes called the vitreous chamber, chamber because it contains the vitreous humor, also called the vitreous body. Now we make our aqueous humor right here in the ciliary body, and that's going to circulate around. It's going to circulate posteriorly into the posterior cavity and anteriorly, not only filling the posterior chamber of the anterior cavity, but also circulating through the pupil into the anterior chamber of the anterior cavity. Here we have our scleral venous sinus, and basically we make as much of this stuff as we drain out. And when we don't, when we either make too much of it or don't drain it fast enough, then that results in the condition called glaucoma. Now, let's look at the lens here and how it is attached to the ciliary body. We have got these little ciliary processes. These are also, this is what makes that, that aqueous humor. But we have also, they form the attachment points for these suspensory ligaments. And where the suspensory ligaments are collectively that hold the lens to the ciliary body, we call this the ciliary zonal. And the actions of the muscle in here, the muscle within the ciliary body, is going to change the tension on these suspensory ligaments. And so that will change the shape of the lens. And the lens is also a clear structure because, again, light must pass through it. So there are two clear structures in the eye. There is the cornea, which is the external structure, the external part of the clear part of the eye, which is continuous with the sclera, and part of the fibrous tunic. And then we have the lens, which is held in place by the ciliary body and is behind the iris. So don't get these two confused. So as I like to say, if you confuse these two, I'll take off double points. So don't confuse them. All right, so the vitreous chamber, as we've said, is basically the posterior cavity. So don't get that confused with the anterior and posterior chambers of the anterior cavity. I know sometimes the naming gets a little bit convoluted, but it's only called the vitreous chamber, synonymous with the posterior cavity, because it contains the vitreous body, which is this big blob of gelatinous stuff that really helps stabilize the eye and also helps keep the retina pushed back on the back of the eyeball. So it's a very important thing. And over time, it can start to 
the proteins that make it up can start to to coagulate and you'll get what are called floaters so if you see those little things that you chase around some of those they're things that sort of are visible in the vitreous body they will actually as light comes through it'll cast shadows on the retina this is what causes floaters and sometimes the floaters get so bad that the vitreous body has to be replaced in what's called a vitreectomy and that's uh, I actually know someone who's had it done. They actually have to pull the eyeball out and, and replace it. But in any case, that's uh, the vitreous body can get imperfections in it. And we will see that any time we have imperfections in any of these structures of the eye, so the cornea being a clear structure, the lens is a clear structure, I should have said the vitreous body is also a clear structure contained within the posterior cavity because it too is transparent and must allow light to pass. All of these things are clear. Anything that light has to pass through has to be transparent. And any of these things can fall prey to things that will make them opaque. So the cornea can have damage, and that can damage the surface of it, and then it can become scratched or infected and have, have uh, become opaque. And then that can actually cause blindness, even though the photoreceptors are still functional. The Anything that blocks the passage of light would prevent you from seeing anything. So the cornea can become damaged. It can also be easily replaced because there are no blood vessels in the cornea. So the cornea is, required, is dependent on the tears for its nutrients and diffusion. So we've got the cornea has no blood vessels in it. So it's actually fairly easily replaced. So you can take a cornea from a donor that doesn't even have to be of the same blood type of the person who is receiving it because basically what will happen is there's no way for immune cells or white blood cells to get in there and cause a rejection reaction. And the other thing that can happen is you can get cataracts within the lens. And we have special proteins within the lens called crystallins. And they are basically making these these they're long, thin proteins. They've ejected all their cell, cellular organs. They have no nuclei, basically. And there are these long, thin proteins that interact and make this sort of network that is these sort of layers of cells that if they become damaged or that those layers become sort of crossed or, or damaged in some way that the proteins are no longer transparent, then you get cataracts. And so sometimes a lens replacement can be done as well. They used to do lens replacements from cadavers. Now they usually use some kind of synthetic material. And lens replacements can also be done. So you can do corneal replacements, you can do lens replacements, and you can even replace the vitreous humor. All right, so the lens fibers here, again, these are called crystallins. They don't have nuclear organelles. This is so that light can pass freely through them. And these are going to uh, allow the lens, they're somewhat flexible, so they're going to allow the lens to be able to focus. And other than these crystallins, we have elasticity of the lens, some very elastic capability of the lens so that it can take different shapes. It can be flat or it can be spherical. And we'll see this is very important when we look at the focusing power of the lens. Next, what we'll do, we'll cover next in the next segment, is light refraction. And we'll talk about how light enters the eye and what it does and how it is transduced into a neural signal.